Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange. My name is Dr. Dan Platt. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Grit Health. And welcome to today's session on Moving Medicine Forward, Highlighting Humanity and Patient Experience in Clinical Trials. Uh, we're so excited to have you here today and to have a great, great panel that I'll be introducing in just a few moments here. Um, today's session is really focused on how we can improve clinical trials, where we've been, where we are currently, and what we need to do to make things better at a community level, at a participation level, at making things more equal and more just within clinical research, and why it's so important to do that. Um, our panel today comes from a number of different areas, um, pharma, industry, uh, government, um, and we're really, really excited to have these different viewpoints and bring them together today to really explain and, and focus on what each party is doing and what we're doing to work together to make these changes. Before I introduce the panel, I thought it might be a good idea to kind of level set for everyone and talk a little bit about where clinical trials were and clinical research, where we are now, and so that we can kind of set the position and understand what we need to do to move forward. So the first question I'd like to address is why clinical research is so important. And really, there's no improvement in medicine, no improvement in treatment without clinical research. It's the path that we that physicians, that the public needs to take in order for things to get better, in order for patients to have better care. It also allows a comparison of treatments. So clinical research is the reason we don't still do bloodletting, uh, for example. It's the reason that we can compare treatments again, one against another and know that one treatment is better than another. Without that type of research and without the, the um, patterns of research that have been established, like randomization and double-blind procedures, we wouldn't be able to do the work we do. It's really the foundation of evidence-based medicine. Um, it is the reason that the last 50 years, 60 years have been have seen such great improvement in care. Um, it's the reason that we have the treatments we have now. So all that said, it's still incredibly unequal. And we face an uphill battle in order to make things better because of the history of what's happened and what's come before. And that really has to do with the fact that ethical and sound clinical research is a relatively new concept. Um, those things I mentioned, like randomization and double blind, they didn't really come into form until the 1940s. So you can kind of invalidate most of the research that came before that. Meanwhile, ethics in medicine and ethics in clinical research has been very slow to really kind of move forward, which I think we all know some of the things that have happened. But to give an overview of that requires that we identify the key problems that have happened in clinical research and that we, we be uh, explicit about them and that we take them into account as we start to build from here. So it's important to mention that things like the American eugenics movement in the 1920s, which led to a lot of the studies that the Nazis did during the Second World War, in the 1800s, clinical research in the United States was pretty much done exclusively on slaves, on the mentally ill, on orphans. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly poorly done. And it was done that way because people were not doing the right thing. People were not taking into account the personhood, the importance of, and the needs of people, the needs of patients. Um, we got to the point in the 1940s, seeing after what, what came from the Second World War and what led after that, like the Nuremberg trials and bringing those Nazi doctors to justice, um, people recognized the importance of really starting to put some rules down to clinical research, um, starting to protect patients' consent, um, benefits being greater than risks of clinical research. However, really at that point, that only applied to white people. Um, things like the Tuskegee syphilis study, that started in the 1930s and continued to the 1970s, in which doctors from the government um, failed to treat um, African-American men in the South who had syphilis and basically watched the disease progress in them, full well knowing that they had penicillin and could treat them. They also hid their disease from them. One of the most uh, damaging to, um, to American medicine uh, events in, in our history. Um, those things still echo today. Um, I think people are probably also familiar with Henrietta Lacks and her treatment at John Hopkins University where her cells were taken without her consent. This led to huge improvements in medicine, but it's still a, a black eye in the way it was done. Um, because of all these things, we now recognize and we know the importance of ethics and research, but we're still struggling to catch up. 
We're struggling to catch up in the United States in terms of how minorities are involved in clinical research, in terms of how um, people who have lower socioeconomic status can get access to trials. Um, we're still catching up in, in, in finding people and in making a diverse and demographically diverse community to come together for clinical research. Um, because of all these, all this history, the trust has been eroded and we need to rebuild it. We need to bring people together and we need to find new ways and better ways to engage with um, patients, to engage with advocates and to bring people together to the table so that we can have these conversations and continue to improve medicine. Um, currently, there is a huge underrepresentation of minorities in clinical trials. Uh, in cancer clinical trials, Black and African American um, men and women represent only 5% of the, of the patients that are in those trials currently, um, even though they're about 15% of the population. We really need to improve that. Um, similarly, Latinos represent less than 1% of the patients in clinical trials. Uh, in the cancer space. So there are huge areas where we need to improve and we need to better adapt to the demographics of the United States currently. Um, with that, I would love to introduce our panel uh, now that we've level set it. Um, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Kareem Watson, um, who is the head of the All of Us program and who I'm so excited to have here. Um, Dr. Watson, if you could please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're bringing to the table today to talk about. Thank you, Dan, so much. First of all, what an amazing way, introduction in a way to level set today. And I have to give, and because this is so patient-centered and community-centered, I have to thank the organizers for really putting the patient at the heart of this. And even the invite, the way I got here to the table today is actually through a patient advocate. And I wanna thank Kimberly Richardson from the Black Cancer Collaborative and her advocacy. And I think we need to have those invites more often than not come from patients. Because too often as the researchers, as the government, we're inviting the patients to the table. But I think it'll be a true sign of equity and inclusion when the patients are inviting us to the table. So I wanna thank you to Kimberly and her advocacy and her work. Um, I sit here both as a cancer disparities researcher, as well as the chief engagement officer for the NIH All of Us Research Program. And I'll tell you more about the program later today after our introduction, but um, I'm first a son, I'm a brother um, who's been impacted by cancer disparities. I love what the advocacy exchange is doing and, and your, the statement that you all made earlier that there's not a one size that fits all approach to cancer disparities. And, and that's how I got here today, Dan. Um, I got here as a cancer disparities researcher who did work in cancer prevention and control, particularly focusing on the lack of representation of African-American men in lung, prostate, and colorectal cancer screening and prevention studies. And I got here through my own lived experience with family members, with an uncle who lived in the rural South who died at an early age of prostate cancer, only to lack of access of, of care, through my um, mother and father both being impacted by cancer, and neither of them ever being offered an opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. And we know in the cancer space that oftentimes clinical trials can offer innovative, life-saving treatments prior to FDA approval that we see that right now today and what the advances that we've been able to have in the COVID-19 research space. So with that, I sit here and I hope to bring to the conversation, yes, my role as the chief engagement officer in the All of Us Research Program, but also bring my experience of over 20 years as a cancer disparities researcher. And lastly, what I bring as a healthcare administrator. I had the fortune of actually serving as the associate executive director of a group of clinics called the Mile Square Health Centers, which is a group of fairly qualified health centers in the Chicagoland area, one of the third oldest community health centers. And that was truly to date has been the pride of my career because being able to provide um, support the care and research and build up a research agenda within a community health centers of populations that are historically underrepresented in both care and research was an amazing opportunity. So thank you for this space today. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson, and thank you for bringing both your experience and your personal um, experience with cancer to the table to speak with us today. We so appreciate it, and I'm, I'm personally so impressed with what you have uh, been able to do and um, the work that you do in Chicago, uh, and reading your bio was such a pleasure, so we're so happy to have you. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Brian McMahon. Uh, Brian, if you could jump on and tell us what you are doing to uh, and what you're bringing to the table to talk about today and what you've done uh, to make clinical trials um, easier to access for people. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, good morning. Nice to see everybody here today. Um, Dr. Watson, great introduction. Uh, to kind of build on that, you know, I really sit here first and foremost as a caregiver. Uh, so in the, there was a 10-year period where I was a cancer caregiver four different times. My mother, my grandmother, my business partner, and my father-in-law. So, 
you know, I, I think the, the thing that ties us all together through this advocacy is that we've been there, we've lived this, we've seen what it looks like to navigate treatment decisions and clinical trials and how do you talk to your doctor? What happens if it's not brought up in a consult? How do you sort of bridge that conversation? And seven years ago, I started an organization called Spark Cures and our aim is to help people find and understand clinical trials. And, and the challenge here is that the, the thought that I'd like to leave everybody with here is that clinical trials, the worst time to go looking for one is when you need one. And this is not a moment in time search. We look at this as a journey and a journey requires a relationship and relationships require trust. And I think that the earlier we can engage and have these conversations, because a clinical trial might not be right at first line treatment, might not be right at second line. You know, it might be second or third. We just don't want people walking into this saying, well, I'll consider a trial when I've exhausted all my other options, right? It's okay. If you make that decision and you go through that with an informed decision-making process, that's quite all right. We just want to make sure it's not made out of ignorance or lack of awareness on that side of things. So happy to talk through that. Happy to be here. And thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Brian. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Karis DeBeal um, from Bristol Myers Squibb, who has um, a, a pretty impressive cancer journey coming from Royal Sun Kettering to BMS. Kara, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what, you're, what you've managed to pull off at BMS would be amazing. Thank you so much. And, and again, thanks for organizing this and inviting me to join uh, this amazing discussion. Uh, my name is Kara Stabile. I work at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb as our patient engagement capabilities lead. I oversee BMS Study Connect, which is our global website where patients and caregivers can learn about and find clinical trials. And I also work with my team on evaluating and bringing in new patient-centered digital tools to help patients along their, their clinical trial journey. Um, I'm an epidemiologist by training. Uh, before joining BMS, I, I worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for about 10 years, where I was doing mainly research and patient-reported outcomes, patient quality of life, cancer survivorship. Um, and I, I even worked with some former patients and caregivers to develop an electronic remote symptom monitoring tool for people undergoing treatment. Um, this topic in particular is very close to my heart. I am extremely passionate about research about the patient provider um, and patient sponsor partnership and relationship, uh, patient empowerment. Uh, at MSK, I had the, the real honor and privilege of sitting with patients and working directly with them every day to understand their disease and how they were moving through their individual journeys and how could we make that better. So I look to bring that experience to my work now and to this discussion and make sure that we're providing patients with a voice and that voice is embedded in how we're delivering trials and improving access. Thank you so much, Kara, and thank you so much for being here. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Rachel Bird, who is a member of my organization, Grit Health. Um, Rachel, could you tell us a little bit about why you're here and your background? Yeah, thanks for the little intro, Dan, and thank you again to all the organizers for the opportunity to be here and be on a panel of such Excellent voices. Um, so as Dan mentioned, my name is Rachel Bird and I am a senior research coordinator with the GRIT Health Research Team. Um, so I bring a little bit of an interesting perspective to clinical research as the research that we do with GRIT Health is patient experience research. Um, so we're really talking to patients about their experiences throughout treatment um, and understanding based on what they've been through, um, how we can improve that for others. Um, my passion kind of for this field um, arises from my early childhood and into adulthood. Um, my youngest sister is a stage four Wilms tumor survivor. Um, she will be 19 years cancer free in July. And um, from a very young age, that showed me that I really wanted to go into healthcare in some form, but wasn't really sure where that would be. Um, and during my undergrad, I actually lost my paternal aunt and uncle to very aggressive cancer diagnoses. And I saw a lot of the successes and failures of the system through watching their journeys. Um, and it made me realize that clinical research is definitely really where I wanted to be. So um, I've been a member of the GRIT Health Research Team for going on two years now. And through both my personal experiences, my academic research and professional growth, I've really 
continued to learn the abundance of value of hearing everyone's experiences with their treatment so that we can really help to improve the state of our healthcare system. Um, and that, that's something I'm trying to live out every day. So I'm excited to be here and tell you a little bit more about the value of patient experience research and how that can help um, improve clinical trials as well. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so in order to get into our panel discussion, I'd love to start with Dr. Watson. Um, the All of Us program is such a special thing and a special way for people to really get involved in research. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it came about and what it's really doing to change the narrative around clinical research? Thank you for that question, Dan. And, and I really love the, the level setting that Brian started off with as well, talking about the importance of knowing about clinical trials before you need them. And, and Brian, I like to frame that in terms of access and awareness. And Dan, you even talked about that. And just, I find that a lot of people don't even know that um, when I first told my family that I was gonna leave a, one career path that I thought was gonna take me into a career in healthcare and then going down a career in research, I had one family member actually use the word, so you're gonna be engaging people as guinea pigs. And they used that word and it stung, but I had to understand where that history came from. And Dan talked a lot about that history earlier as he talked about the United States Public Health Service study, looking at the progression of, of syphilis in the African-American male that was conducted in Tuskegee, Alabama. You know, my family being from the South, that study and other studies were very much present said, you know, at the top of their mind. So when I told them I was going into clinical research, I had to remind them, and I used to remember telling them, have you ever taken a drug that was developed by, I mean, that was a prescription written by a doctor or a nurse practitioner or any provider? Have you ever taken a drug that's been on the shelf that you're able to buy? I said, buy. I said, well, guess what? All those drugs or all those treatments went through clinical trials, four phases of them. And there were people that were involved in the study of those drugs and or devices. I said, and the challenge becomes when people do not reflect the diversity of the, of the rich U, the US, we then develop drugs and treatments that we don't know if they're generalizable to all populations. We, when there's lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion in studies, we don't know if those drugs and or treatment or interventions that are developed will be able to treat everyone with equal results. So the All of Us Research Program is actually an innovative approach to build one of the world's largest data sets. And while the All of Us Research Program is really interesting because we're actually not asking a research study. Some research programs are developed where they're trying to see if drug A is, is, works just as well as drug B or if intervention A can work better and or just as equal as intervention B. We're actually creating a large database. What we hope to be the world's largest database of patient information of a million or more Americans. That includes information on biological information. That includes information from people's electronic health records. That includes information that allows us to understand the human genome better in ways that we've never understood before. But we're also not just collecting biological information. We're also collecting survey information. We collect information on people's impact with COVID-19. We're collecting information on social determinants of health. So when we do this right, because I won't say if, but when we do this right, Dan, at the, in the next five years or so, we'll have a million or more participants in the All of Us Research Program that truly reflects the diversity of the US. To date, we've enrolled over 450,000 participants. And I'm proud to say that 80% of those participants are what we call underrepresented in biomedical research. That includes over 50% participants that are diverse in race and ethnicity, which is unprecedented. You talked about the lack of African-Americans in clinical trial. For example, of that 50% racial ethnic minorities in our study, 20% are actually African-Americans or Black or African descent. That is a huge advance in understanding the humanity and patient experience in clinical trials. But also we think about, we don't just think about underrepresented biomedical research in terms of race and ethnicity. We also know that place matters. I also and said one of my mentors, Dr. Robert Wynn, would say that ZNA sometimes can be more important than your DNA. What he meant by that is that your zip code can sometimes determine your health outcomes more than the genetics that you were born with. So we understand that. So we've been intentional in engaging rural communities, even engaging populations from urban communities that have historically been underrepresented in biomedical research, populations that are greater than 65. We've all talked in some way about, or a few of us have talked about being caregivers to family members. Well, when you think about clinical trials historically, those that are older than 65 have often been excluded from clinical trials. And so we've been thinking about those populations that are at the extreme of ages, those that are young, as well as our populations that are getting older in age. But even thinking about our sexual and gender minorities, our um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations. And then it's so important that the All of Us Research Program 
is looking at not just, like I said before, the genomics or the DNA, but understanding how that information may intersect. Because really, what in order to address a lot of the health disparities that we're seeing, Dan, we have to address that inter what I call intersectionality, right? It's not enough to just know that African-Americans have a higher rate of chronic kidney disease than some other populations. But we must understand, A, if there's a genetic component to that, how can we intervene in that genetic component? But we also must understand if there's a lifestyle component to that. And we even under have to understand how we began to disentangle structural inequities that may exist, right? So that's what the All of Us Research Program is really doing. It's really hoping to, to disentangle that, that old model of a one-size-fits-all approach. And we began out of, we're one of the largest initiatives of the National Institutes of Health Precision Medicine Initiative. And so we are really hoping that, and not only are we ensuring that we have diversity in our participants, but we also understand the messenger matters. So we also have intentional efforts to diversify the researcher workforce as well. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Watson. It's such a huge leap forward and I'm so excited to start to see the results of the research that you're doing. Like you said, um, the need for a genetic understanding, especially with, with so many new targeted treatments in the cancer space, um, that unfortunately those, a lot of those trials didn't have the demographics that were necessary. And so we're seeing things like, um, you know, uh, African-American men have much worse rates of, of response to CAR-T, um, but those trials didn't really involve uh, it didn't really involve patients uh, all the times that had the various demographics. We had to learn that in the real world, which should never happen. That needs to happen in clinical research. So thank you so much for the work you're doing. Um, I'd like to move to Brian. Um, so uh, you told us a little bit about your personal uh, background with, um, with research and seeing the experience of your family. Um, but I'd love to know kind of how you decided to start Spark Cures and how you went from recognizing that there were so few resources to starting to build those resources for patients. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I, uh, Dr. Watson, there, there's so many things I want to jump on top of what you just said there. I, I think you made so many great points, and I know we'll get there uh, through this conversation, but as a, as a precursor to all that, um, so I was sort of introduced to the world of cancer back in 2005 when my mom was diagnosed with a cancer called multiple myeloma. And the, the challenge that we faced was they caught it really late with my mom and she had multiple high risk genetic features. So the prognosis was really poor. They gave her 30 days, even with treatment. Now, the difference is my mom was not your typical patient. She was an oncology nurse and had been one for over 30 years. And at the time she was working at Amgen. So not only does she have the clinical expertise and experience to navigate research, she also has what we like to say, the Rolodex that comes along with working for one of the largest biotech pharma companies in the world. And the difference in this is that within two weeks, my mom was down at the University of Arkansas and enrolled in a clinical trial. Two weeks was how quickly she was able to turn that, right? And you know, the outcome is that my mother ended up living for just about two years with the disease, which I like to say it wasn't the outcome that we wanted, but it was due to that clinical trial and clinical research and all the patients that came before her, we all stand upon the shoulders of giants. The only reason, you know, if you look at the 1960s, and I, I know part of my conversation is very myeloma dependent, we had really one treatment. It was malphalan, right? It was a, a high dose chemo and that was it. And then the seventies come stem cell transplant. And now we have uh, 14 or 15 approved therapies in the myeloma space and people are living longer and longer with higher quality of life. And, you know, so it really opened my eyes up to the power of clinical research, what that gave to my mom, what that gave to us as a family. But the challenge here is that you shouldn't have to be a nurse working for a pharmaceutical company in order to navigate this. You shouldn't have to have that level of expertise and experience. And as I mentioned in the intro, in a 10 year period, I was a cancer caregiver four different times. My mom was the only one to get into a clinical trial, the only one. And I remember sitting at a, at a major academic uh, center and my father-in-law had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, caught it late, um, you know, not a good prognosis again. And they talked about, they basically gave us two options. Here's the really aggressive form of standard care, or here's a little bit more, uh, you know, this, this is something we can do that might be a little bit more comforting to you, but it's really not going to help that much. And fortunately or unfortunately, we knew enough at that point to say, what about clinical trials? Is there anything here or nearby? And the doctor said, you know, there's nothing here that he's eligible for. But if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you do a search and you come back at our next appointment, bring those results back and we'll have a conversation around it. Fine. So we did. And even geographically constraining our options, we were left with over 300 options on clintrials.gov. And I'm not throwing stones at clintrials.gov. The challenge is, what are we left with as a family? Do we print out a thousand pages of ct.gov trial information and take into a 15 or 20 minute consult to say, 
what do we do? Right. And it was at that moment we thought there has to be a better way to help navigate this. There has to be a better way to help people. If we know enough about the trials, right, the inclusion exclusion criteria, right. And if we know enough about the patients, we should be able to help them. And, and Dr. Watson kind of building on what you said there, and I really like this. So uh, most of what we do is driven from patient uh, requests, right? So when we start doing this, we allow patients to filter on top personal preferences. How far can they travel? And we started calling them centers of support. We had people saying, well, my cousin lives in Seattle and my best friend from college is up in New York. These are places where I could go to stay for two, three, four, five, six months if I was going to participate in a clinical trial. But that ZNA is such a huge component, right? And building upon what you said there, if you look at where patients receive care, on average, about 85% of patients are going to receive care in a community setting, not at a large academic research center, right? So it's kind of that geographic luck of the draw, right? If you're in New York, you're in the cusp of, you know, NYU, Columbia, Wild Cornell, MSK, you know, all these places. And when we think about the disparity side and we think about accessibility, if you look at clinical trials, so we've taken our own proprietary data set and we've done some research on this. Only about 19% of trials are available in a community setting. So 85% of patients are receiving care there, yet only 19% of these community centers have a trial to offer. And typically, it's based off of the co-op uh, co groups, so SWOG or ECOG. So if anything, you might see one that's looking at maybe the addition of one treatment on the standard of care. It gets even worse when we think about new novel therapies. We talked about CAR T-cell therapy. If you look at bispecific antibodies or CAR-T, which is huge right now in the myeloma space, only about 12% of community centers are participating or have the ability to offer this novel treatment that is giving exponential progression-free survival and overall response to patients with myeloma. So when we think about that ZNA side, Dr. Watson, I think it, it just resonates so strongly. How do we push the understanding and awareness? It's gonna take time to get community centers the ability to run these trials if, it enter, if ever that occurs. But how do we push the understanding and awareness and accessibility so that they can help make those connections to large community centers and how do we make it easier for patients to participate if they're not, if they haven't won the geographic lottery, if their ZNA, you know, hasn't panned out that way. Um, so really th that's how we look. And I'm not sure if there was some additional sides of that that I, I missed, um, Dan, but if there's something else that you want me to go down, I'm, I'm happy to. No, I think that was great, Brian. And, and I think, you know, as we start to talk more about the community level, you brought up some really key points um, that we'll get into later on in the conversation. Um, Kara, uh, coming from your background of being in Memorial Sloan Kettering at a place where you've, you've seen this happen at the academic level, at a high academic level, and, I'm, and seeing the, the community involvement or, or lack thereof and the, the need to transition over, you brought that to BMS and have started to make some changes to Study Connect. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've done and what BMS is trying to do in order to kind of adapt things and change this narrative? Yeah, and I'll start with, with MSK, actually, um, because Dr. Watson mentioned there's not a, a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, there's also not a one-size-fits-all approach to how we design and run clinical trials, and MSK um, has been doing really great work in that regard. Um, and at BMS too, we're, we're addressing some of the traditional and sometimes antiquated approaches to running clinical trials. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a different way of doing things than our IRBs or even our clinicians are used to. Um, so we're, we're trying in an MSK and at BMS, we're trying to help change the mindset of how trials should be run um, and how we can connect and communicate with patients in ways that work for them and help improve their outcomes. Um, and that work has been expanded at MSK. At BMS, um, we're really focused on patient recruitment and increasing diversity in our clinical trials. We have a network of patients that help inform clinical trial design, protocol design. We partner with patients and caregivers and advocacy groups uh, to gather insights and create a better experience to make sure that what we're strategizing is reflective of the patient journey. Um, we're working to break down some of the barriers that, that both Brian and Dr. Watson mentioned. Um, one of those being that patients may not know that clinical trials even exist. Um, and then as Brian alluded to, I mean, finding one that's a good fit, it's like finding a needle in a haystack sometimes. 
So uh, we built our own clinical trials website, which is Study Connect. Um, we provide information about the conditions that we research, what it means to participate in a trial. We have real patient stories on there so, so people can hear from those who've been through it. Um, patients can take questionnaires that match them to both BMS and non-BMS sponsored studies. So patients can really get a, a holistic view of trials that they might potentially be eligible for. Um, we help patients connect with recruiting study sites. So we're all about trying to provide information, awareness, and connection. Um, you know, we feature stories on diversity in clinical trials and share resources from advocacy groups. Um, we partner with, with organizations like Brian's, like SparkCures, uh, making sure that multiple myeloma patients get over to his website so um, they can receive the one-on-one -on -one care and connection that they need during this process. Um, so with Study Connect, we've, we've really moved away from this clinical trials.gov type of hub that contains information that is not well understood. It's hard to action. Um, and we've moved into a specific focus on what patients really want and what they really need. Because ultimately, um, we understand that by removing the barriers and but providing better resources and support, we're going to get the benefit of having more patients um, understand our studies, we're going to increase diversity, and we're going to increase participation and retention in our studies. So we all sort of win in that regard. Um, and patients are going to get the, the right care that they need when they need it and when they want it. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you for the work you're doing at BMS to really improve this at the at the, the, the corporate level, at the pharmaceutical level, to really drive innovation and trials. Um, I'd like to bring it over to Rachel now. Uh, Rachel, could you uh, talk a little bit about what we do at Grid Health, which is a little bit different than um, what Karen or what Kareem, sorry, what Kareem, Brian, and, and Kara have talked about? Um, what is patient experience research, and how can it make a difference in clinical research? Yeah, definitely. So um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, patient experience research is a little bit different than a lot of other traditional forms of clinical research in that it focuses really on what the patient experience was throughout from diagnosis all the way through survivorship or end of life care. Um, it really helps us to understand the full patient journey so that we can partner and speak with pharma about how we can better treat the patient, not the disease. Um, and at the end of the day, we really want to be able to be a sounding board, especially at GRIT and through patient organization, uh, our patient, um, patient experience research pro projects. We really wanna be a sounding board for patients' experiences and understand everything that they've gone through so that it, it can, they can know that those experiences truly matter and that they weren't just a number or um, just one of many patients that have gone through a similar experience. Um, so we really try to focus on the social, psychosocial aspects of their experiences um, and how treatments may have affected their quality of life, their relationship with their family, um, how impacts may have, um, like financial impacts they may have had, um, how travel may have impacted their ability to connect with others, um, how immunocompromised may have infected them, especially during the times of COVID. Um, so we really try to focus on all of the elements of their quality of life um, throughout their treatment journey. Um, in general, patient experience research is also a little bit more of an accessible form of research, which um, kind of goes to the point that I know uh, Dr. Watson and Brian were both making about your ZNA. Um, I grew up in a very rural area of Michigan. So um, when my family members were going through their cancer diagnoses, it was really difficult for them to travel for treatment as well. Um, what's good about patient experience research is that a lot of these projects are surveys or online engagements or phone calls that you can make in the comfort of your own home. And you're able to share the experience that, hey, I have to travel one way two hours to get my treatment and that doesn't work for me. So how can we work with my community center 
to make sure that I'm able to get the treatment that I need or the testing that I need in the interim while I'm waiting for my next infusion. Um, so it's really an opportunity for us to kind of bring that research to the comfort of the patient's own home and let them know that their voice is being heard. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so uh, before we move on to the next topic, I know Brian, you had something else you wanted to add to the conversation? Thank you, Rachel. You know, I really appreciate you sharing in the beginning about your sister. And we didn't know this prior, but there's a, a collision here that I think is really interesting. So Wilms tumor actually runs in my wife's family. And her uncle actually was diagnosed with Wilms tumor early on. And he was part of one of the first clinical trials that Dr. Farber from Dana-Farber ran on Wilms tumors, which established uh, actinomycin D as the standard of care, which is, as far as I am aware, is still the standard of care today. So how interesting that we're on this, this panel together. And when you think about that from 60, 70 years ago, right, the, the leading charge, like how that standard of care was established still to this day. So I just thought that was a really interesting collision. I really appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, I hope your sister's doing well. Yeah, she um, was diagnosed stage four when she was three years old. Um, but she was able to get treated at University of Michigan um, and had a really excellent experience. And that's really kind of what ignited my desire to kind of go into healthcare. Um, and then her experience was very contrasted with that of my paternal aunt and uncle. Um, and it just goes to show the difference between pedi pediatric care and adult care um, and how different the support resources there are for families, for pediatric patients as opposed to adult patients as well. So um, I was really moved by Dr. Watson, you talking about different health disparities and how they relate to especially age, because pediatric patients may have a lot more support than those who are going through their diagnosis at age 60, age 65. Um, so it's huge that we're able to use these opportunities to address how those patient experiences may be so different so that we can hopefully improve it so that every family gets the support that a pediatric patient would, um, because that's huge at the end of the day. Thank you for bringing that up, Brian. Um, we're, we're all here with, with individual experiences, but there's so much collision between what we've, what we've been through and what everyone on this panel has experienced. Um, I'd like to bring it back to Dr. Watson. Um, you've done amazing work in the community in Chicago, and I think that probably has led and contributed to the work that you want to do at the national level. Um, I'm wondering, how do we continue to educate people at the community level to continue to encourage participation? And what can be done then to take that model and drive so that we, we can expand clinical uh, access to clinical research more nationally? Thank you for that question, Dan. And, and I like uh, one joke that I told someone is that when I was doing my postdoc, um, with, in Dr. Wynn's lab at UIC, I said I had two leaders. I had both Dr. Wynn as my scientific leader in my postdoc, and I had community stakeholders as my other teachers in the postdoc. And both of those teachers were just as valuable. I was fortunate enough to be trained in community-based participatory research, CBPR. So in my research uh, pedagogy, the community is literally driving the work that I do. And they were really determining how I answered, the, the asked the questions that I developed. They were determining the community areas that I went into. And I'll give you a concrete example of how it's so important. So historically, African-American men have been under-engaged in research. When you think about the national lung screening trial that was done by the NCI, it was one of the largest trials and it moved the needle. I'm so amazed that it was one of the studies that really let us know that through low-dose CT, a particular type of lung screening, you were able to reduce lung cancer mortality by 20%. That's huge. That was a huge advance in science. But if we being critical of that, that advancement though, that study was done in 53,000 participants across the US, about 33 different sites, but only 4.5% of the participants were African-American. And when you think about that 4.5% of participants that were African-American, that nowhere near reflects the population that carries the greatest burden of disease. So, but a, another thing that came out of that study that was groundbreaking was the policy implications. Actually, the United States Preventive Services Task Force actually changed the lung cancer screening guidelines based on that pivotal study. They determined that this, if you smoke this many cigarettes for this amount of time, if you are asymptomatic, then you qualify for lung cancer screening. Well, imagine when I went to drop those screening guidelines off in our, our community clinic in our fairly qualified health clinic. You know, excuse me for being using the vernacular, but one of my physicians looked at me with a side eye and was like, you gotta be kidding me. These are the parameters in which you think I can screen for lung cancers. 
my patients don't smoke this way. They, this is not the smoking behavior that they have. You haven't taken into account um, structural or environmental factors that they're exposed to. Where's the question about chewing tobacco for those in the South? You know, where's the question about diet and alcohol use when it comes to tobacco um, exposure? And this, this physician asked me these questions and I was like, I'm sorry, it's, it's nothing I can do about it. These are the guidelines. She looked at me and she's like, really? As a researcher, there's nothing you can do about it? And I, I was like, thank you for that reminder. So we wrote a new study and that project was called Shared and it's now been funded by the NIH. And that project was actually looking to see how can we engage African-American men as citizen scientists to first get them aware that lung cancer is a health disparity and to get them understanding that prevention and this early screening in lung cancer can save lives. But we also talked about the importance of culturally tailored um, educational resources. We found out that the screening material, that the education material that was developed for lung cancer screening, it didn't reflect the language or the, the population that carry the highest burden of disease, nor could my providers get through that pamphlet within a 17 minute visit when they had to deal with all the other things that those patients were dealing with. So just that simple fact of being able to engage African-American men as citizen scientists to change how we think about getting access to lung cancer screening. With, I'm hoping it's going to be a game changer. But, and, but this, this concept of involving community has been something in the All of Us research program that we've done since the onset. I am so proud that our former CEO, our founding CEO, Eric Dishman, was actually a cancer survivor. And Eric knew how to leverage his privilege. Eric said that as a straight white man, he was able to understand and get access to treatment and innovative care for his rare kidney disease that others would not have access to. And Eric set out on a mission to ensure that others, despite race, ethnicity, social economic status and geography, were able to have the same experience in cutting edge innovative research that he had. But even despite that, we still have a long way to go. I'll end with a story similar to Rachel. Rachel, I'm from the Midwest in Michigan as well, from a small, small town in Michigan on the west side of the state. And when my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer about three and a half years ago, they were getting ready to start a treatment, a chemotherapy treatment. You shouldn't have to have the cell phone number of the cancer director at the University of North Chicago for that treatment to stop, right? So I called up Dr. Wynn and Dr. Wynn said, Kareem, stop. Have they done molecular targeting? Have they done molecular testing of your mom's tumor to see if she qualifies for molecular targeted therapy? I'm a cancer disparities researcher. I know about molecular targeted therapy, but in that moment, I was just a son. I didn't think about stopping the chemo, I mean, not starting the chemotherapy. I had my family in one ear, you know, my mother wanted to be treated close to home, Rachel, like you said, she didn't, we wanted to get her to Ann Arbor, but she wanted to stay near home where she knew the doctor. She said, well, I know this doctor. I know this community. I want my church members to be able to come by and visit me. So it was very important for her to get her treatment in near where she lived. So when Dr. Wynn said, stop, don't start that chemotherapy treatment, that was a game changer because guess what? She did qualify for molecular targeted therapy. And just being able to get that molecular targeted therapy, it extended the quality of her life. It didn't extend the quantity of her life. She went on to live for another 12 months, but the quality of that 12 months gave us time as a family to say goodbye, for her to die with dignity, for her to transition with the support of hospice care. And not everybody gets that privilege, right? Not everybody has the cell phone number of a cancer center director that can have their mom's tumor looked at. That, that, but you shouldn't have to be a cancer disparities researcher to be able to get access to innovative care. And so we're hoping that in the All of Us Research Program, we can even ask Rachel questions about access to care in our database. We can look at questions about, do you live, how close do you live next to an NCI designated cancer center, right? Because that matters when it comes to access to innovative care. So um, that's, those are some of the ways that the community, Dan, has been at the center, both of my personal work, but in all of us research program, we have a community network of over 150 community-based organizations driving the way that we do our work. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Watson, and your experiences. And that just rings so true that patients really want that comfort, especially when they're going, and we all do, when we're going through something traumatic, like a cancer diagnosis or a diagnosis of anything for that matter, of a serious disease, you want to be able to have the comfort of your community and your loved ones around you. And that helps to establish trust. To have to travel halfway across the state 
to walk into a cancer center you've never been to, to do one of the most intense treatments of your life is a really huge barrier for a lot of people. And a lot of people don't even want to go into a restaurant on their own, let alone a whole cancer center and do something so, so scary. Um, so I'm very excited to hear about everything that is going on with the All of Us initiative and the questions that are able to be asked for everyone that is involved so that we can help address those issues because they are really important to be addressed. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson and, and Rachel for that, the, that additional comment is it's so, so important and really bringing, you know, our goal now is to bring research to the community and rather than have the community come to research centers. And so it's so, so important. Um, for, for Karen and Brian, one of the things I'm struck by is that we all recognize the importance of the community, but a lot of the work that our organizations are doing are at the digital level. We're doing this um, on the internet. We're trying to build this community, this particular structure. How can we use what we built to really kind of bring things to the community and incorporate um, at the community level? Um, all the changes that we want to see more broadly and more nationally. Um, Brian, you, you in particular have mentioned the, the, the importance of bringing this to community. How are, are you doing that with Spark Cures? And what do you think needs to kind of adapt with the digital mindset and research in order to improve that? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. I, I think there's a couple ways to think about it. Um, you know, Kara, we talked about this the other day and she made the point uh, when we had a meeting where it's nobody's going to say, you know, I want a BMS study or I want an Amgen study, or I want this, right? People aren't going through and looking at it in this way, right? So I think for a lot of us, it's what I mentioned before was, you know, on this journey, how do you build a relationship and how do you build trust? And Dr. Watson, you know, I, your story really resonates. I mean, you know, people want to be where their, their support system is. I want to be here. I trust my doctor. They may not be the leading expert in the world on whatever type of cancer, but it's who they trust, right? And I think that part of this is opening up that conversation to let people know that they can see a specialist while also maintaining their local care. But in the absence of that, how do we go to wherever the patient is, right? We don't want to make the patient come to us. We want to go to wherever they are. So if they have a trusted resource in a local community doctor, how can we provide them digital tools and support to help further that conversation, right? And in that side, uh, we have what we call our, our, our pro portal. So for healthcare professionals, which we're giving out free to any doctor in the U.S. where they can search for, sort, filter, and screen on a de-identified manner, any clinical trial in the multi-myeloma space across the entire country, right, to see what's happening at their center, to see what's happening nearby. And what we find is that oftentimes there's these, you know, doctors may or may not be aware of all the trials at their center. And we have seen instances where we're onboarding them into a, our, our portal, and they'll say, I didn't know we had that trial here. Right. And it, it just goes to show if you're at a high volume center where there might be 30, 40 trials, it's hard to stay on top of that, even with those weekly meetings and the email alerts that are occurring. So for us, it's how do we support the, the doctors, the people who have that trusted relationship so that they can have those conversations with their patients to help them understand what this is going to look like? Yeah, I was just going to expand on what Brian was saying. I mean, I think gone are the days where our trials are done exclusively at a hospital. Um, so, you know, at BMS, we're, we're looking to decentralize that process and bring trials to patients into their communities and into their homes um, and build an, uh, a set of tools to help patients on that journey. Um, but, you know, we're, we're doing this work, we're moving away from the institution and to the patient. There's so many possibilities. Um, where we can use digital technologies for community engagement and leverage them to enhance equity and improve generalizability and, and improve outcomes, um, which is the work that we're doing now. But um, we can't just throw shiny things at everything and think that that's what patients want and need. Um, we need to make sure we let go of our assumptions. You know, it's very easy for researchers and clinicians to think like researchers and clinicians. It's harder for researchers to think like patients. So for us, we're, we're looking to alter that perspective, um, let go of our expectations and our assumptions of what real good care looks like and treatment looks like and build a foundation of trust. And I know everyone was saying it here, a foundation of trust and information and transparency that has not always been there. 
Um, and, you know, making a decision about a clinical trial, it's, it's significant. With all of the stories that we've heard today, it could be one of the most important decisions you make in your life. So, you know, while we're focused on decentralizing and digitizing this process, we have to ensure that the human element is embedded in everything we do. Just to kind of echo what um, you were talking about, Kara and Brian, uh, at the end of the day, patients listen to people that they trust and patients really listen to other patients. Um, they want to hear other people who have been through their experiences and understand what they went through, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're really striving to do with a lot of patient experience research projects is to connect patients with other patients who have been through what they've been through. I know we've talked about CAR-T a few times. Um, CAR-T is a really interesting and up and coming treatment where a lot of patients are like, I just wanna to talk to somebody who have been who has been through this, and I have no idea how I can make those connections. Um, so through patient experience research and also being able to engage a patient's community, um, you're able to educate other patients potentially who may be considering something, um, uh, considering a similar treatment, and they're able to connect with someone who's been through what they may be about to go through, and it may help them feel a little bit more comfort in their decision as they're making it. Great points, everyone. Uh, I think, you know, this is such an important time to actually build these, these connections. Um, you know, I, I think you alluded to it, Kara, but there's also, we're also overcoming a bias among researchers, among physicians, about who to go to and ask for clini about clinical research. It was mentioned, I think, you know, we have 15 minutes as a physician to try and speak to a patient, not only about their disease and what they've been experiencing, um, about, you know, what they can expect from treatment, but then to talk about a clinical trial, such a, a, an additional huge undertaking and something like 70 to 80% of patients still hear from clinical research from their physicians. So there's a duty on, on that side to really kind of make things better and to, to improve the way we, we do that. Um, recognizing that we're, we're coming uh, down to time, I'm just going to pose one more quick question. Um, all the folks that are, that are here that are on this panel speaking to you, we come from different areas. We've been in academics. Um, we've been working for smaller companies, for bigger companies like BMS. Um, uh, Dr. Watson has been working at the community level and then also at the governmental level through the NIH. Um, so one of the things that we haven't talked about is advocacy and the role that advocacy organizations can play in helping to build all these things that we're, uh, that we're discussing. Um, I'm wondering whether anyone would like to, to speak up and talk a little about what they see the role of advocacy organizations being. We are on the advocacy exchange after all, and how we can all work together to, to really kind of fill the gaps that exist and that we've talked about in terms of representation and community activation towards clinical research. I'll kick us off, Dan, but I'm a government employee. I'm a public servant. When people reach out to me and they apologize, they say, I'm sorry to bother you. First, I work for you. You're not bothering me. Um, please reach out. It's my job. But even the fact that the Precision Medicine Initiative, it actually came out of the, the funding for it came out of the Cures Act. And I'm always amazed when I run into and Cures Act was supported through patient advocates, just like Brian and Rachel and Kara, right? So Patients have amazing advocacy. I don't want to denote that uh, everyone has access to advocacy because that's not where we are. But there's voice for advocates to be able to drive how funding is, distrib is distributed, how funding is supporting certain innovative cures, and, and making sure that funding gets to populations that need it most. So advocacy can really be a great way to start and determine where funding goes when it comes to research. I'll just say, um, I think advocacy organizations, um, you know, they have a leg up on us in pharma in terms of that trust and reputation. Patients look to you. They want to learn from you as advocates um, who, you know, who's walked through the journey, really. Um, so I, I think advocacy organizations have a responsibility to educate patients and and their loved ones on why trials are important and how to find them, how it might impact their daily lives and their families. And um, continuing to be a bridge between patients and pharma is critical as well. Um, but I also think it goes both ways too. I think in order for advocates to educate patients and be an engaged contributor in research development, we really need to ensure that advocates 
have what they need to improve their, their scientific understanding, their clinical understanding, their awareness of the research landscape so can, they can be better allies in this, in this space. Um, and you know, researchers and, and advocates well, researchers haven't always been recognized as, as advocates in, in scientific discussions and discovery. And we're looking to change that narrative um, and, and do what we can to make that better too, so. It's unfortunate that we, we ran short of time, but um, I, I hope that people were able to get some questions addressed for other people in the chat. Um, if there are further questions, um, please feel free to, to email. Um, some folks on the team and we can maybe connect you with resources uh, and please visit the website to the advocacy exchange website to see the resources that are being posted as well yeah i, I think the, the the closing thought i have when we when we think about how to be better advocates i think it's how do we elevate the patient voice one of the things that really struck me was we did a patient ad board uh several years ago when the world was still normal and we were able to bring a number of patients together in the philadelphia area uh for an ad board and one of the things that really struck me about this is that we get to build these relationships with patients. We're talking to them on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, whatever their needs are. And it's oftentimes the first time that pharmaceutical uh, you know, executives and people are hearing these stories and seeing the challenges around inclusion, exclusion criteria, seeing the challenges around you know, geographic challenges. And I think that the more we can continue to yell at the top of our lungs, this is what it looks like. I, I got a call from a, a, a pharmaceutical uh, executive, you know, a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about maybe launching a compassionate use uh, program for an, a, a drug that's going to be going in front of the FDA soon. And I said, you know, this is amazing. The only thing I would I would ask is that you try to remove now myeloma. One of the big criteria points is measurable disease that's done through M spike, um, and a lot of times compassionate use will still require that. And measurable disease in late stage myeloma is oftentimes an exclusion for a lot of these patients who aren't presenting in the way that most of these trials want, right? So how can we sit there and take this feedback, the things that we're hearing from patients about the need to be in the community setting, the need to change that inclusion and exclusion criteria, and not just hit copy and paste from one protocol to the next, right? And really looking at the, the patient populations that we're looking to help and who have the highest need, especially in that relapse refractory setting, how can we be that voice for them and carry that through in a way that resonates because they often aren't able to connect with pharma in the same way that we are. I think that's such a critical piece. One quick closing comment is just that as a kind of to echo what everyone has said here, we as researchers are just a vessel for delivering the ex patient experience and for understanding what patients have really gone through. So we are just the megaphone for um, everything that they have gone through and what their experiences are. And we're here to elevate the patient voice and make sure that it's heard by pharma, by the government, by industry, um, just so that we can continue to improve moving forward. So I just feel very lucky every day to be able to amplify um, the voices of patients who have been through these experiences. Thank you so much, Rachel and Brian. That is a, a, nice, a really nice way to, to end the conversation. Um, we appreciate everyone being here on behalf of the panel, Dr. Watson, Brian, Kara, Rachel, thank you so much for, for tuning in to watch us. And I thank the panelists so much for a great, great conversation and really uh, walking through what we're trying to do to make a difference and where we've come from and where we're going. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. <laughs>